Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and uh, sorry for the delay, and, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty happy to be here. I must apologize, first of all, because I'm, um, I, I've, uh, this is a, uh, I was telling this uh, to Robert before, it's something which I've been doing uh, 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 as, as a labor of love for years. I was never able to get a grant on these, so you see that the work is scattered over 20 plus years. And um, so I've, I've put uh, lots of things together and uh, I'm uh, switching on my, my uh, buzzer because I get enthusiastic and when 40 minutes go by, I'll wrap up anyways. So let me, uh, let me share my screen and um, let me, uh, I hope you can see my full screen. Yep. Is it okay? Yep. Okay, so um, scaling in ecosystems and um, and uh, uh, briefly what uh, I'm intending to do. Oop, how do I go back? Something interesting. Okay, um, these are uh, just a brief note of my uh, main collaborators on this subject. But I would say that uh, um, the, the the most uh, this is a uh, Amos Maritan in Padua, the theoretical physicist with whom we built much of the thing. This is uh, Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe, a friend of a lifetime, Penny Chisholm, who introduced me to, to ecology, in fact. Marino Gatto is an ecologist. Uh, Giant Banavar, also a physicist. And let me, Samir Suvais and uh, Andrea Giometto, former PhD students here at the BFL, and now uh, colleagues. Uh, let me go, let me talk uh, somewhat briefly about uh, my plan. I will be talking about, well, I'm, I'm sending you scattered messages, actually, but I hope I will convince you that there is an underlying um, uh, a certain co theoretical is this coherence and, it's, and, and, and then like early developed try, daily efforts to uh, make experimental verification. So the, uh, the funny ideas we have and um, in my, in part in my, wet lab here in Lausanne. Well, actually we failed so far, but uh, so most of what I'll be telling you is probably appropriate for this audience will be of theoretical nature. Uh, we're making a few examples on, um, uh, well, uh, first I will minima uh, about uh, scaling tools, um, essentially scaling the common sense and uh, a finite size scaling, which is an important tool for what I care for. Then I'll be talking about a few examples from ecology, like uh, what kind of information is in fact uh, contained in the size spectrum it is something you can measure effectively since uh, say 20 to 30 years, uh, but it's regardless of species. We're talking about the math, which is aggregation process with injection essentially, which has a distinguished uh, 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 history of uh, uh, exact results in statistical mechanics. Um, I'll be talking about uh, some empirical evidence. Uh, and uh, one thing I care very much for, the fact that traditionally ecology treated scaling laws as uh, independent, they are not. And I try to convince you of that. And then possibly, uh, uh, again, the, the punchline is beautiful. It's not mine, it's Kadanov's. It says models are fun and sometimes even instructive. And they'll be trying to convince you that the scaling arguments can in fact uh, um, uh, uh, tap into uh, what is called a stochastic metabolic theory of ecology. Uh, very briefly, the, just uh, as a matter of introduction, and if anybody's interested, interested in the mathematical introduction that starts really slowly, then it accelerates towards the end. It's a wonderful uh, uh, paper by M.E.J. Newman on contemporary physics in 2005. I think it has something like 4,000 citations, by the way. But it starts from the easy math of uh, the probability. What is a scaling function? It's a power law, essentially. I won't... Uh, bother you with details about how you get and when you can normalize in fact distribution, but essentially um, it's the only scale invariant uh, distribution in the sense that if you rescale X, it still remains a power law with the same argument. And um, this can be normalized only if you, uh, uh, in the random, the underlying random variable is concentrated in a minimum value larger than zero and infinity. Now, uh, uh, for instance, uh, that makes absolutely Good common sense. It doesn't exist a city of zero inhabitants. It's not a city. So you define what is the minimum size of a city, and then you count the percentage of cities larger than, and you get a curve that looks like something decreases like this. But if you put it in a log log plot, it started showing up as something which um, re recalls at pr practically any scale um, a straight line on a log log plot. Now, I've been at the time of my friend Per Bach, uh, I, I, I attended a serious theoretical. Uh, uh, physics uh, um, conferences in which people were debating and when can you call a power law 
a straight line or a semi or semi straight power law um, power law in a log log law. But in reality, what is important about these power laws are important because they are scale invariant, because they are the signatures of a self organized critical phenomena. It is um, something which in open dissipative systems with many degrees of freedom uh, would tend to do inevitably the same thing. Uh, uh, self-organizing into states which have the same uh, features. So in a sense, um, the opposed to critical phenomena where you tune with a screwdriver some parameter to get this particular behavior. So essentially statistical inevitability is important in nature. I, I, we argued and worked on it. And, um, and um, uh, then manipulations are quite a few. And what is interesting, if you have empirical sets, like a set of um, a data and you want to see whether they obey or not, to a power law, something which in this case is out, uh, generated in the sample in which you do, like um, with some uh, inverse sampling procedure, can generate um, uh, in silico data sets of zillions of uh, entities who can actually uh, 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 test uh, practical problems. And the fact is, you simply take a sample and you bin the data. Um, you may run into problems, uh, especially towards the tail of a, of a distribution. Whereas if you do some logarithmic binning to ensure that um, your sample is well, uh, sample when you have uh, like uh, decreasing number of, um, of, uh, 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 of uh, data out of numerosity of a sample for very large ones. But best of all is to sample, to just simply uh, take the simple thing. You take the samples that exceed a certain value. So you don't have a problem of binning. And what you do have is that you have an estimate because essentially the probability of exceedance is the PDF. Uh, uh, the only thing is the exponent, you have to take out one. Many a consequence I won't tell, and the uh, maximum likelihood is exact uh, from the uh, from the sample of data. But uh, interesting things is that you apply to wealth data, for instance, you found easily that depending on the value of alpha, you may uh, you may randomize or not. You may have in the infinite limit. Uh, um, if it is, for instance, if alpha has to be larger than one, larger than two, you have like uh, uh, a converging mean. But then you have a diverging variance in the infinite sample size. So you can actually use the sample size to characterize alpha. And uh, you get empirical estimates. And if you take, for instance, estimate of the wealth worldwide, very, very unequally distributed, you have a so-called 80-20 rule when you have this exponent of the order of two. That is, 80% um, uh, of the wealth is the hands of a 20% richest fraction of the population, um, just uh, as a matter of introduction. But um, uh, let me show you an example which is relevant somewhat to the subject of the discussion. And um, I want to talk about something which is very physical, which I started out with, total contributing area at the node of a tree. And this is a book that uh, uh, kindly uh, uh, you've been referring to, Hank. And um, that's a book I wrote on fractal river basins, 2001, in which there's much of this part here. There's one that just came out in 2020, still with Ignacio, with an ecologist, we take concepts in uh, scaling in ecology in a proper context. This was published in 2020, and nobody paid any attention because Cambridge University Press is not what it used to be. They couldn't care less, they don't advertise it, it's not, there's no reviews on that, etc. If anybody's willing to read it and review it, it'd be, I'll, be, I'll be inviting you for dinner. Let me show you briefly what uh, this is telling you. Essentially, you can extract um, a, a graph uh, from a digital terrain. Now, I would do that, it's not, um, it's a technical thing, but essentially what you have is that you can have remotely uh, acquired and objectively manipulated information such that you can characterize, this is a, actually an actual basin in which you take steepest descent directions as the uh, link directions. And what is extraordinary about the networks is that they, uh, notwithstanding the external diversities uh, uh, that you have in nature, they show a, a deep symmetry, uh, regardless of size, climate, vegetation, or whatever. And, um, and you can extract these shapes, but um, I need this essentially uh, to make an example. How do we characterize, for instance, the total number, the contributing area at a node? Okay, in these cases, a tree has a unique uh, uh, drainage direction that is a gravity, uh, 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 gravity steepest descent, the, the topographic gradient. And what happens is that um, you can extract a graph by this automatically, of course, a G GIS does it automatically, such that at any node, for instance, this node has one, two, three, four, uh, what you have in this place, you have three contributors plus the drainage area itself. So you have four, in fact, units of area to characterize this point. Why we move to this point, you have 12 because you connect. 
So you have to define an adjacency matrix, which is fairly easy. But in this case, it's particularly simplified by the fact that you only have one um, per every place, details aside. So the equation, which is interesting for us, is something like that. The uh, total contributing area, that is total nodes you have in your back uh, uh, because of topography. And, and assuming that this is a tree, I won't bother you with the fact that this is a very reasonable and very solid theoretical uh, 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 assumption uh, on the basis of um, uh, theoretical, I mean, at least in the runoff generating area, but that's something which is, uh, on which I could uh, 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 bore you to death for, for a sizable amount of time. So the total contributing area, oops, at, uh, let me see, can I push this up? Oop. I, don't know. I was trying to, I'm sorry, this, I cannot push back the, well, whatever. Otherwise, okay, it goes. So the total contributing area in node I, like here, okay, is the sum of all contributing areas connected to this guy here, that is this guy, this guy, and this guy, in the case of this node. Um, that means uh, that um, uh, uh, the adjacency matrix is something in which um, Wji is equal to one if J goes into one, and is zero otherwise. So you take your nearest neighbors and um, whoever goes into yourself, plus one, one means that you're measuring area in pixel units. That's an interesting matrix uh, 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 on which we can talk about eigenvalues forever, et cetera. But uh, to me, what is sufficient is to convince you that you can measure it fairly efficiently. Uh, say from 10 meter, from the 10 meter scale, 10 by 10 meters with the early recognitions to the scale of thousands of square kilometers. And what is remarkable is regardless of climate, soil, vegetation, et cetera, you get uh, that thing which reminds Newman's plot uh, uh, of a size, relative size, a fraction of cities of a certain size. That is um, parallel lines in very different catchments with a very consistent estimate of the slope and highly non-trivial in the sense of critical phenomena. So the probability of a that area is larger than A, a certain value, which is in log, which is a logarithm, uh, scales like area to the minus 0.43. Forget about these for, for the time being. So essentially, it seems that this is a good way of measuring it. And uh, this, in fact, calls for something which is called an aggregation process with injection, something of this kind. You see that um, in the case of a river, you don't assume that um, uh, uh, this function here, it doesn't change in time. This because I'm frozen in time. But you have shifting injection patterns and thereby shifting uh, mass in this in, in this manner. So essentially, the simplest case, random walk, essentially you have that Vij, something which is equal, everything being equal, let me go briefly to that. You can have it in any node, you can have like, uh, uh, you can only go uh, by uh, choose at random with equal probability between the two nearest neighbors downstream in a direction in which this is time, for instance. So this is called um, uh, the, uh, the Scheidegger River, Scheidegger was geographer, and this is in particular important in statistical mechanics because it maps directed networks uh, and the so-called time activity of uh, abelian sand piles. So uh, this, why am I mentioning this? Because this you can solve exactly. And the solution is four thirds, far removed from the values observed in nature. We are far less aggregated, but there is a very good uh, uh, analytical solution that tells you what happens. Um, now, as I was telling you, the uh, the probability of exceeding was 0.43 and the probability density function plus one is minus 143. And that explains these kind of shapes that we see in nature. We do have other things like, uh, for instance, if you take Peano's construction, I will not be bore you with that, but it's a very interesting cookie because it has a topology which is indistinguishable for real rivers. And yet um, it is, um, uh, uh, it is multifractal, it's an exact multifractal, it maps binomial multiplicity process, etc. completely solved. And then we have a very important case for what I'm, I'm trying to show you today, which is the mean field case. That is, you can have something which you don't have necessarily to jump to the nearest neighbor. You can go anywhere with even probability. It is essentially, um, it, it's called the neutral perspective. That is, in any place you can have interaction wherever you want with the same likelihood however uh, uh, ecologically unfair. But what is absolutely remarkable is that um, uh, neutral uh, pattern doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that you have a neutral process. And, um, and uh, that's something quite interesting. Why? Because this can be solved exactly. 
And the relevance to uh, ecology comes from the fact that if you take the catch data, the number of schools of tuna fish um, of a certain size S uh, plots uh, uh, beautifully well. There was um, Eric Bonabo, it's, it's a very good uh, bunch of um, uh, uh, statistical mechanicists from France. It's the same equation in the aggregation process of injection, how groups form and deform. And, um, and uh, so you have uh, the catch data of a year of uh, uh, yellowfish tuna or skipjack tuna or big eye tuna, then take a, uh, the same, the whole thing together. And what you have is that the number of school sizes um, looks very much like a power law. With a slope is very close to these three halves, or if you want one half of a probability of exceedance, which is a value that gives you the indication that this is a kind of a mean field process with all kinds of implications. And, and people have been working on that. I, I, I heard from Robert that um, Ian Cousine gave um, a specialist of those patterns, biological patterns and aggregation, which have interaction of individuals generating to large scale patterns, spoke at this distinguished seminar series. And Simon Levine is arguably the best uh, theoretical ecologist worldwide. What is interesting, and that's something will have to do with what I intend to do later, is that um, um, if you have, uh, if you study school size distribution of a certain, it's a different sardinellas, whatever they are, it's a, it's, um, it's a sardine essentially uh, from the catchfish, et cetera. They showed effects of this kind, like a cutoff at a certain size, which would be an important part of my following, of my following consideration. So this showing a first side from data uh, of uh, the so-called finite size effects, there is something like, uh, it seems like in the distribution of sardinella, there's an upper limit of the size of a group that can be glued together for uh, biological or physical reasons. So this fundamental tool I was talking about is the finite size scaling. That is um, a system which um, it would be like a perfect power law, uh, uh, but uh, as we know, power laws cannot extend it to, to, from zero to infinity. There has to be first a minimum size. There is a lower cutoff because for instance, you can define the city with zero size, uh, you can characterize with that model, of course, because uh, 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 it wouldn't be normalizable, actually. But you can have cities of infinite size either. Uh, at the same time, you have a certain phenomena which uh, have upper and lower cutoff for physical reasons. And uh, so in a sense, the idea that there is not a characteristic uh, scale embedded in the process, a, a byproduct of a scale invariance postulated by mathematical form that easy and that powerful, then instead there is an embedded scale which is procured by the process itself. A good example is um, this review carried out by uh, the lead author is uh, Guido Caldarelli, now professor in Venice, a former student of uh, Amos Paritana, was in his committee too. It says the following, this is, the, uh, this is a, 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 a map of the connectivities uh, of a, uh, the connectivity of nodes uh, at the internet level globally. It is something which you have a, a gazillion number of data and you see the connectivity of each node goes straight like this. If you take a sample, a smaller sample of that, and this is what is enlarged here, uh, what you see is this, and what you see is that the distribution dies much earlier. Why? Because if you take this guy, you can certainly have clusters bigger than the size of a region you sample, right? And at the same time, if you do that, um, if you do this, then you die even earlier. That's a very clear effect of a, a finite size effect, clouding the debate, uh, clouding the true essence, the underlying essence of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, of a power law, of a pure power law. And this was uh, contrasting certain arguments that were deciding that this is not a power law based on statistical testing, right? Which makes absolutely good sense, but the quality of the answers you get depends on the quality you ask. There is a very good reason for this not to be a power law. And uh, uh, this is true underlying uh, a hidden power law that uh, stems from this. What is the argument of a power law? It's something of this kind. There is a function that dies early and you have a certain maximum, for instance, in the case of the area of a, of a watershed, you cannot have a, a, a areas larger than the maximum size of a catchment you're examining. And you can take sub camp, sub samples in which this will apply even earlier. So the idea is that uh, this is proportional to uh, the power law we're seeking times a function which has to go to zero when A approaches A max with some form. Interestingly, although many people use exponential decays, the function, the specific, detailed specification of F 
uh, can be skipped because certain properties can be uh, can be studied without actually having that form, which is a quite a remarkable result. But simplifying matters, uh, if you have this estimate and if you plot a to the minus beta times this probability against a minus a max, you have to have a unique function. And the power is that this is universal, if that is true, and you don't need to specify the function itself. That's what happens to rivers. And um, there was a review I carried out. I'm very proud of it. You said, uh, this is a cat, this is a, oops, a very well, how do I go back? Okay. Uh, this is a, a river in Italy, pretty large actually in size, uh, and you sample subcatchments nested into it. And when you do that, once you do that, you multiply this by the average estimate is pretty good, actually 0.44. You said that this function collapse and it's a function that dies and goes to zero at the same value. So the argument here applies in a quite surprising manner. Among the consequences, uh, you can take whatever scaling function you have, and you take a ratio of consecutive moments, this is the length from any point to uh, the source, um, you can actually have, and if this uh, is, is the underlying thing, you don't have to do anything assuming anything, you take the ratio of the moments with different areas, and you see whether these actually are parallel lines. If they're parallel lines, the mathematical argument applies. And, and now really uh, down to a, a quite, um, uh, more seriously into macroecological relationships that suggest scaling properties. And what you're seeing here, that's a sample uh, of a possible uh, uh, scaling laws, uh, empirical scaling laws. There's a, a, a gigantic literature. You may be talking about, um, uh, uh, well, actually I can, I can show in detail what this is. For instance, it could be the so-called um, uh, uh, the uh, community size spectrum, that is uh, with a certain mass, you have a certain proportion a fraction of organisms uh, with the same mass or surrounding the same mass, regardless of species. This is what, in fact, uh, uh, you can measure by flow cytometry quite recently. So essentially, you can uh, uh, a green stain, you can cyber green stain what is actually not detritus, but uh, living organisms, and you can get count their size one by one on large numbers. Uh, what is interesting is that this is an interesting thing, which seems to re recall a power law, but Depending on where you are, you don't get the same scaling exponents. Scaling exponents become uh, very important, in fact. And, um, and uh, the reason why this is uh, so important is precisely the great predictive capability that uh, the exponent entails. But you can have so-called Damuth law, I'll be showing you the originals, that is um, the number of individuals of a certain size uh, uh, against the size. It's called the thinning law. You have less and less of a guys bigger and bigger with certain regularity uncalled for, which is quite remarkable. What is interesting, what seems to be constant is that the scaling behavior, not the exponent, there's nothing universal about the exponents. And um, uh, uh, one very important one, which I will at the end, is metabolic rates against regressed against body mass. Uh, this is fundamental because it operates over a, a gigantic or, uh, uh, orders of magnitude being the subject to so much scrutiny on that or the species area relationship. Let me show you one by one. This is the most, uh, uh, the, the closest uh, thing we have in ecology to an ecological law. There is something which have um, a power law, at least for intermediate, but intermediate means from say 10 acres in this historic plot to 10 to the nine acres here. Um, there is a one-on-one -on -one relation or similar one-on-one -on -one relation between the number of species and the area, which is an interesting uh, thing has been uh, a, since, uh, well, since the 19th century, in fact, empirical law. That is, the bigger the size of your ecosystem, think of an island, for instance, uh, island by geography, right? Uh, the bigger the number of uh, species you may breed in there, whatever species you'll be talking about. Or something which is very important for conservation, that is, does the biggest organism scale with ecosystem area? That is, the largest size of the guys that the resource uh, limitation can provide, is it a function of the area? of an independent closed ecosystem like an island. Um, it, it, it seems so, that's what uh, Jared Diamond with Burness uh, argue, and the scaling exponent seems to be one half, which is quite remarkable. We tell you that if you do, for instance, if you fragment ecosystem, you can expect that the biggest guys may very much soon uh, run out of the possibility of surviving in there. It becomes more shaky, and that's what Robert May, the, the big shadow of Robert May, operates. That is, um, species abundance uh, um, uh, regresses against um, 
body mass, that is, the number of species with smaller sizes are way more numerous in a regularly and probably predicting manner to the size of the, of the, of the, uh, of the animal. Mammals, uh, arthropods, uh, uh, bugs of all kinds. Uh, that's uh, something in which you do, you do have problems here because now uh, finding out what characterizes a scaling is the possibility of going across scales, across a sizable number of scales. And this empirically is very complicated. Or the famous Damuth law, that is, if you take crude population density, it is the number of, of um, in a certain isolated ecosystem, like an island, think of an island, but it's been tested otherwise. And you take uh, the population density, that is the number of individuals, the abundance of individuals uh, divided uh, uh, by the area against the body mass. It means that the smaller you are, the more numerous you are, the more larger the abundance you have, which is, um, a, a remarkable property, in fact, yet with a hell of a lot of scatter, of course. And um, uh, population density could be crude population density, could define home ranges, etc. cetera. And, um, and um, uh, I'm interested in one of those in particular, something in which I was interested in spatial fluctuations because, for instance, I, oceanic phytoplankton and Penny Chisel from MIT, good friend of mine and a phenomenal person and a wonderful scientist uh, were telling me, or can you explain to me why oceanic phytoplankton are patchy on all scale of uh, observation? Why, if you take, for instance, a cruise along the Caribbean as she did, and you measure with a flow cytometer, whatever comes seen, and so you go, you know that you're going across gradients of uh, environmental drivers like temperature, nutrients, et cetera. You go to oligotroph oligotrophic uh, areas, uh, et cetera. What you observe is something of this kind. But is if you take the log of a fraction, put everything into a flow cytometer, and you can measure, you see a good four to five uh, or so magnitude in size from the smallest bugs, the phytoplankton approaching bacteria to almost zooplankton overlapping or not, uh, et cetera, you cover four to some magnitude. And what you get once you take a sample and you count the relative uh, fraction of uh, uh, living organisms, say whatever the species you get with size larger than S is a hell of a straight line. And you wonder why doesn't nature produce certain sizes because they're more efficient? Why all sizes? And why this uh, wonderfully regular proportion? Uh, this is at the heart, and you do that wherever you go into the ocean. And this is the heart of the idea of what is statistical inevitability, regardless of initial condition, boundary conditions, uh, parameters to tune, whatever you want. This is what nature does in nonetheless. It's very important to understand why. And this is what I would call a very clear power law. If you take, for instance, a guy bothered uh, to go through the super spectrum, but he's, he was like taking every single sample wherever taken from flow cytometers and put it in the same count. And what you get is a slope of this thing, which is a very important value of these two, because it means equal biomass per size bin. Like if nature wanted that to happen, I know that biologists will jump on the chair when I say nature wants, but it is something, something inevitable, like a dynamic attractor of, a, of the system you have in there. Now, like, well, I mean, let me speculate a little more about what is the probability of a certain the size spectrum of mass M? Is the sum of all, of all species you have with a simple sample uh, times this is the, uh, the size distribution of a given species or functional group, whatever you can resolve, times its abundance. And this sum is extended to the number of species. So there's a bit of what you measure there quite easily comes down to determining things that are not easy at all to determine. So uh, for instance, um, the population abundance, now you have to characterize the case species, quote unquote, and, um, and the species size distribution. Well, in some cases you can do actually, because um, it, you can, especially, that's what the work that the lab of Penny Chisholm did, uh, certain species of phytoplankton you can go DNA staining and getting the actual proportion of precisely that species. That I'll be showing you now. The other assumption which you do, uh, you assume that um, density of a, of, a, of a bug, of the organism is mass independent, thereby the probability of mass is the probability of volume. Why is this important? Because flow cytometry measures essentially uh, volume by forward light scattering tools and proper calibration. Now that's what we had in there. And what is interesting is that these are the size distribution we'll show in a more clear manner. Depending on where you go, okay, you will see that in reality, you get something which reminds you 
they, there was also the Iron X experiment in which you had certain bugs uh, favored at certain times, but something which recalls like a power law with different slopes, however, and these are the relative abundances that you had in the system. So essentially you had now four groups, bacteria, which is a mess because we can't resolve them, two properly uh, identified species, Prochlorococcus and Sinicococcus. Prochlorococcus was discovered by Penichis with the most abundant photosynthetic um, living organism on, on Earth. And then you have uh, uh, ultra nanoplankton, something like a, 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 a zoo of different species which you don't resolve. So um, I'll be concentrating on this. I'm, I'm going relatively fast because I'm approaching the end of my talk. And so they have, what happens is that, and that's interesting because that recalls what you have in reality in a number of cases. For instance, um, uh, you have overlapping sizes. With certain size, you may have, uh, we have, have Sinicococcus and Prochlorococcus. Nature doesn't do the exclusion, right? So you have a certain size distribution. You can measure the size and you assume that some of those arguments have a finite scale in forms. Well, uh, about technicalities that be able, I'd be delighted to discuss if you're interested later on. What happens is something like this. If you do the same trick you've seen with the rivers, what you have is that uh, it seems that um, the two guys that are two species are doing a good job in collapsing. The guys in which you know there's a zoo of different things don't. So this is not a proof, of course. But certainly strongly suggestive that you can correlate uh, the mean size with the abundance as you expect some sort of a thinning law so you have an idea that you do have a connection between microecological laws treated as independent. So you have a size spectrum, which depends on a, an exponent eta, and you have uh, the number of species with typical mass m, which is abundance, uh, like uh, in, in a place you have in a place here, with exponent delta, and all of them more or less seems like straight lines, right? And Damuth law, the equivalent m to the gamma, out of consistency, you have to have it eta is equal to delta plus gamma. Now, fast forward, you'll be, uh, if you run a stochastic uh, uh, model, in fact, uh, there's a, a pretty sophisticated, actually, uh, position, uh, a, a, a mathematical community dynamic model, uh, which is a stochastic one, which has speciation, all kinds of features in it, etc. What you see in there, once you do late evolution, uh, go freely in silico, what you have is that in reality, you do see that uh, uh, even in completely uncalled for, you get that this relationship is, um, is respected uh, in a, even in the scatter plot, the easiest one. And uh, if you don't do that, that was done before uh, Zauli and others, um, uh, only delta was supposed to be the same. You see that this is not uh, accepted. So the idea is, can we try a synthesis? The synthesis is that in reality, you have, uh, these are the, the, the usual suspects, all kinds of scaling laws that you have um, in these places. And, uh, well, let me go fast for that. Uh, the idea is the following. Suppose that now you have two related variables, something which you have a probability of um, mass and abundance, the joint probability of mass and abundance, given a resource level, which in this sense, we think it could be the ecosystem size. And uh, uh, that's what we have. So. Um, a species, a probability we search the probability distribution of finding a species with a characteristic mass between M and M plus dm and the population with a certain abundance surrounding N. Given uh, then, that you have to make some speculations that come from those aggregation models with injection, you somewhat are in a stationary state, you're not in a fast changing system. So that's the shape you have. More complicated, but uh, well published, in fact, uh, because we did the first work, you see, in 2007, with my friends, including John Damuth, and uh, the one in which we had the, the further one, we refined it in 2017. So this is nothing but the two-dimensional extension of what I've been telling you earlier. And what is interesting about that, you can calculate exactly moments of a distribution, which depends on the size of the system. And Moments of a distribution can be calculated for even for relatively small sample size, and this matters a lot. Uh, because what you see in here, for instance, the moment of order Q1, Q2 is proportional to a certain exponent, and you can show that in reality you have binding relationship among them, including the, uh, a certain fa the fact that this exponent is the maximum of zero and something which depends on everything else. And um, uh, normalization conditions are imposed, and uh, certainly I won't pest you with the mathematical details, which um, 
are exact manipulation of approximations, of course. Why this really matters? Because the species area law is nothing by the moment of order one and zero. And uh, thereby you can connect uh, the Z exponent people in uh, uh, island by geography working for about a hundred years have seen, or you can actually have the abundance against mass can be is the moment of order one, one in this framework. So you can study marginals essentially moments, which makes life easier. Or you can have the community size spectrum is essentially, which is derived from these theoretically, this is an exact statement, or the maximum size, the same thing, it can, uh, it can be evaluated in this probability uh, to the equation, one of the coefficients we have in the system. And uh, even the log series can be done in the same manner. And I'm just jumping, I know that my time is going to, uh, to, to end up pretty soon. All I'm saying is that there's a coherent, a coherent recruit population density, the likes, etc. So everything is connected to the point that you have like a table in which you say how the, the ideal values that you have in the and like 0.25 of a species area law connects all the other exponents. So all macroecological exponents are connected. So you cannot actually um, a search for any universality. What we have seen in the community size spectrum is absolutely obvious. You cannot compare uh, scaling exponents of a single law in different places, in different ecosystems, because whatever you have in there maintains the uh, attractor, which is a power law, but with different exponents. And this is confirmed by the stochastic mathematical community dynamics I was talking to you about, with interesting finite size effect popping up on all places. If anybody is interested in this, you can go back to the uh, PNAS paper that Silvia Zali and Andrea Giometto's first authors, Andrea Giometto is now uh, assistant professor in Cornell, actually one of my uh, co-authors uh, uh, on these I've been working on. So I'm, I'm uh, getting uh, uh, surprisingly relatively in time in um, uh, what I'm, um, I'll be talking now about 100 years of, uh, 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 of a law which is alive and kicking, which is called um, Kleiber's law. That is, um, if you measure metabolic power, in some matter, metabolic rate of some kind, and um, you regress it against uh, the mean body mass for a bunch of physiologically tested uh, uh, organisms um, is something like over 21 orders of magnitude, a gigantic uh, range of metabolic rates, and even larger 30 orders of magnitude in size, plots like what looks uh, surprisingly like a regularity a law. And what is interesting uh, about, um, about uh, 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 this in particular is the fact that um, the exponent on average is they're called quarter powers. That is something like uh, an equation of three quarters. Now, why this is particularly puzzling, puzzling since Kleiber's uh, 132 paper, almost a hundred years out there, is that because if you take a metabolic rate as a, uh, normally we say, okay, what does metabolic rate, your respiration rate, depends on your body surface, right? So the characteristic size of a body, L square to a size, to a power two. And the mass will be proportional to the volume, which is length cube. So if you took uh, uh, the, 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 the actual metabolic rate against body mass, it should be proportional to the size to a power two thirds. You say two thirds or three quarters, who cares about the difference? Well, over 21 orders of magnitude, this would mean a difference of four or five orders of magnitude in metabolic rate. And that's the first thing which was, um, kind of interesting to look at. Now, moving from the revisitation of these, uh, 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 this is James Brown, the MacArthur uh, Award on 2002, published a series of classic papers uh, called Towards a Metabolic Theory of Ecology, which is important. Why metabolism? Metabolic, uh, metabolic theory predicts our metabolic rate uh, uh, by uh, setting the pace of resource uptake and, um, and from the environment chiefly, and from and into resource allocation to survival, growth and reproduction, control psychological processes at all level organization from single individuals to the biosphere. And, uh, and uh, that involves uh, life history attributes as you have seen before. For instance, if you go here, you see lifespan, heartbeat frequencies, aorta diameter, capillary density, that seems to be like uh, 
an amazing, an amazing convergence toward uh, this thing. Metab life history attributes with the, or the movie, for instance, development rates uh, or mortality of age and maturity, lifespan and whatever. The elephant lives more than the mouse is well known, but the regularity with which this is observed is absolutely phenomenal in a sense. And um, uh, well, uh, the, the, the whole uh, purpose of that is that um, uh, essentially this uh, uh, involves life history attributes. It would involve population interactions and ecosystem, pro and ecosystem processes. So uh, the metabolic rate uh, essentially goes into a system in which you would look at a complete different view of a system. And, and what uh, West Brown and Anquist, uh, this is a thousands of citation on this paper, they um, uh, thought that it was, okay, five minutes to go. Okay, perfectly okay. Uh, that uh, what they had is something like, they thought it was a structure of a biological distribution network um, that would tell the system how in fact um, the quarter power exponent would prevail. I mean, there are those who delight in seeing exceptions to the quarter power, and there are those who are uh, refuse to see exceptions to that. There has to be some sort of a synthesis in that. Now, we came out um, with, uh, uh, with Jayan Banava and Amos Maritan. Uh, we showed that um, the visionary paper was essentially wrong. So it's not true that um, you have to have a certain particularly uh, well-engineered network to do that. Any directed network does the job. And the relation between the metabolic rate defined as when Spran and Enquist have a body mass is the simplest relation, which is D divided by D plus one, where D is the embedding dimension. That is three in the three dimensional space. So three quarters next, uh, quite naturally. Long story short, what I'm making is that, okay, now what is uh, 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 that I don't like about this? Uh, what we've been trying to push through uh, a Synergia project for three years in a row, making to step three and getting ditched at the end, or at least not funded, is the idea that um, this uh, assumes that the species is a single point, a single mass, and the metabolic rate is a single metabolic rate. Uh, neglecting the fact that the body mass, if you measure it, this is an example we did in my lab with Andrea Giometto, in fact, um, if you measure body mass for different species, there are distributions possibly overlapping with very different features, et cetera. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so that's what we did. We studied the, whether these scales, what is interesting is that 14 species of um, protists, in fact, over covering six orders of magnitude, they do collapse in a distribution pretty nicely, actually, if you do that in the lab, regardless of the, uh, and in, in a structure, which assume that the probability of a mass, in fact, is a, some sort of an interesting feature of this kind. So fluctuations are inherent in the system. And what is interesting in particular is the fact that um, why does nature produce fluctuations uh, and heterogeneity uh, of phenotypic characteristic like mass, body mass, or metabolic rate? Because its very response is the evolutionary response uh, to um, to fluctuations and to resource limitations. That's what nature does. It generates all kinds of, uh, of uh, and that's a selective pressure. So essentially, this takes into account the fact that in reality, the mass of a species is not a mass, but it's a distribution. And the metabolic rate is also what we did. Uh, it was a year of work, very frustrating, done with the nanosims machine uh, that, um, that uh, we had in, the, in this. Uh, the nanosims machine is something which um, operates at the nano level. And um, uh, 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 it's a single cell uh, me joint measurements of cell volume and nitrogen carbon uptake rates using this nanosims means nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometry on freshwater phytoplankton, something of this kind. So what we did, it was interesting. We measured, you see, for every species, you don't have a value, but you have a distribution. The only thing is that in six months of work, we could get something like 40 points of joint measurements of cells. And to validate a, a distribution of this kind, you would have to go into a system which you easily, on the back of the ample calculations, like 50,000 uh, 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 joint measurements of mass and metabolic rate, or its proxy, in this case, is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 as a proxy of metabolic rate, which is the uptake of carbon uh, and um, nitrogen through isotopic lab isotopically labeled components. Now, what is the result? The result, which is still interesting, is that coming from the fact that metabolic rates uh, cannot be a single value, you can have like bugs stressed to die, maximum metabolic rates, uh, bugs sleeping or hibernating, I'm just kidding because it's zoologically very crude, 
representation, which is the minimum metabolic rate, or you have a field metabolic rate in which there's not a single value. What is interesting is that this very sketchy case, which still took a year of experimental work, uh, if you do the same kind of reasoning of this kind, you get distribution that seem to collapse. And so that's my take. Uh, we are guessing that uh, if you do that, uh, if you use a generalized uh, uh, metabolic size scaling, in which you take the stochastic relation between, uh, there is a connection, but of stochastic nature, of correlated random variables of this kind, um, then you can run the same show I showed you before, uh, something of this kind, essentially. There was a, the uh, infamous, you see Cicero was the name of a project was this three times in a row. And what you have is that, in fact, so you take into account the fact that distributions are uh, distribution. I mean, you don't have a single body mass, but you have a distribution of body masses. If you can collapse them, you can get um, variability and resource limitation taken into account. And this is the last slide I'm showing you. And this is uh, because we couldn't get the money. We need a high throughput, uh, 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 cutting edge technologies to do that. We need 50,000 at least uh, uh, joint measurements of organisms, uh, mass, and metabolic rates in different conditions to be able to do that. What we have done, as usual, um, we did the in silico evaluation of those organoids in which we evaluate physiologically viable organisms. So we can see that at least in silico, it's obviously not the proof, and you can have a demonstration. So my conclusions, um, I'm sorry I'm late by four minutes, and but I was enthusiastic about this. I said, well, brief conclusion is that um, commonly observed scaling relationship uh, pop out in a number of ways, essentially because there's something inevitable in that, there's something about self-organized processes. There is a process that does the same. Why would the ocean go back to a state in which the community size spectrum, that is the distribution, relative distribution of the material um, is the same. I mean, it's, 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 it's a power law um, regardless, right? Of whatever you're losing. Low, uh, uh, low nutrient content, high nutrient content, high temperature, low temperature, still a power law. Um, it's fairly clear now, but uh, now, by, oops, by now is, is acknowledged that um, uh, the uh, independent, you cannot treat as independent those scaling laws, they are related. And we can actually um, uh, guess that um, sooner or later we'll be able to show that Kleiber's law suggests a stochastic metabolic theory of ecology. And thereby discussions like whether the slope is two thirds or three fourths is perhaps immaterial. But again, uh, much experimental and observational work remains to be done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, I went overboard by... Oh, no problem at all. I've been... Uh, plenty of time. So, uh, thank you very much, Andre. It was a very nice overview of all this uh, this work. I, I, it's fascinating, these, these results, right? I, I mean, it cries for sort of a more broad explanation, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's interesting that also that, that there's new measurements. So I, I think that's highly variable because you, you actually, you know, you... You, you do the detailed uh, experiments. I think that's fantastic. Well, so, but, well what happens it was uh, the frustrating thing is that uh, a year work of a PhD student yeah, was to yeah. measure jointly 40 cells yeah. <laughs> or zero. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. that's what the nanoscience can do. You, yeah. know, you need 40,000. You cannot have 40,000 PhD students working for a year. <laughs> you have to have some other technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I you know that was also the case with DNA sequencing. Eventually, it gets uh, you know gets more, more uh, technically uh, evaluated. Eventually, um, so any questions from the audience? I see Yap has a question already. Go ahead, Yap. Let me unmute myself. Yes, the question I have is: I saw is the relation between the slope on related to the distribution of river branches in the slope on the lot lot plot, plot, can they be related to the value of gravity? And then it would be interesting to be when looking at river geometries and other planets where we have different gravity values. Any ideas if that can be related? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> very smart guy. Yeah, well, I, I know that uh, friends of mine, Bill Dietrich, uh, Anna Howard, work on those Martian networks. What is surprising? Well, you never know whether it's water, by the way. It was probably liquid CO2 when you had the surface of Mars. Uh, I say, I see there's still debate on what the heck was the fluid, but what you see in there, I should have 
Uh, well, I have a picture somewhere, but so, but, but anyways, if you look at those um, uh, pictures of the surface of Mars, you see networks and you see trees. And yes. you see that if you take lenient measures, uh, uh, that is, uh, you take simply topological measures, they are indistinguishable from the one you have on Earth. Now, if you start looking at uh, scaling distributions, it's, it's more subtle. But what is interesting, and uh, as far as I know, no one has done it, to do a proper study of a, a probability distribution of a total contributing area, which you had from a digital terrain map. Um, and that you can do quite reliably, I suppose. And it's going to be a power law, but just by looking at them. Um, no one has correlated that to, uh, to the gravity, as you say. And uh, are you a geomorphologist? Yeah. <laughs> because if you, that would be um, super interesting. The thing is that you would need uh, some other, at least a third yeah. surface, right? At least a third planet <laughs> whose surface you have. Oh, but to two points, you have a certainly a straight line passing through, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly you can calculate nicely the plus or minus in the evaluation of the slope. You do standard jackknife computations. So you, can, you can tell whether this is significant or not. But in brief, uh, it's a very interesting question, actually, but it hasn't been done as far as I know. But I think I'm, I'm on top of that. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's clear I'm a geophysicist. Right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I'm asking you: uh, Do you know of other planets whose uh, digital terrain maps we can have besides Mars? We can. I can. If there's any graduate student interested, Mars, I can ask Bill Dietrich, and and he will provide it. I'm pretty sure we we'll do it together. Whatever. On the Earth, you have as many as you want. Do you know if there's a third planet or whose uh, digital? Uh, uh, I think Titan, I right? Titan, moon of uh, Saturn. I think that's that's quite advanced. Okay, and uh, do, you, do you see networks in there? I, I don't know, I don't know. That no, means... I don't know either. But there's a lot from the Cassini mission uh, where there's a lot of data on the surfaces of uh, moons of, of Saturn. If anybody wants to pick this up, I can give you all the technology to that easily. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Thank you. Nice. Uh, very nice, very nice. Any other questions? Yeah, I have maybe a general question. I mean, what comes to mind? I mean, it's now the the. I mean, we have of course a central limit theorem for you know Gaussian distributions, right? Yeah. Is there any sort of more general framework under which conditions you know the power law would be a sort of a central limit? Okay. Uh, okay. Of distributions, <laughs> and 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 uh, is is there any any. Uh, because, because you attempted to, to look, of course, at all those different cases and you, tr you attempted to sort of explain that by microscopic processes, right? Like this West et al. approach to the Kleiber law. But, but, but there, there could also be a, more, a much more general type of, of attraction you know, of probabilities to a power law type of behavior. Okay, that, is that, okay. it's a very, very interesting question, actually. What we know is that uh, the Levy processes are mm -hmm. exceptions to the central limit theorem. Yeah. The only yeah. exceptions to the central limit theorem. In fact, if you have that, uh, the jumps you can make, it, it, you just need, so essentially what, what uh, well, if, if for the younger guys, if it, uh, it's pretty standard or as for us, but is the sum of independently distributed uh, uh, random variables tends to a Gaussian distribution with the central limit, unless the distribution of it, uh, even one of them is power law distributed, because yeah. then it becomes a Levy process and central limit doesn't apply. And, uh, and uh, what, what we actually see in this year, okay, now, in the mean field system we have, the mean field, uh, it, it, it's obviously the case, right? Because you can have actually, with even probability, you can jump to any other place in any other lattice, okay. and you can get the asymptotic probabilities exactly. Now, if, um, if um, uh, on a nearest neighbor type of interaction, um, you see, uh, the interaction becomes non-local and thereby Levy because of the aggregated structure. So you have a few guys in which uh, if you change it from here to there, then immediately you may touch a pretty large uh, catch. Mm -hmm. That might make a local disturbance becoming a non-local interaction. So what we know for sure is that, um, and that was done, well, the name of the Indian guy who proved it is... Um, What's his name? Well, I can tell you, but that it's called, it's well known. 
Uh, this is Levy and not uh, and not uh, central limit. Can I uh, say something to this yeah, yeah. question? So actually, central limit theorem does not necessarily contradict the power law. In fact, um, exactly um, uh, what what was just said right now, uh, you can combine this non-local um, microscopic processes to achieve to arrive at uh, fractional Gauss Gaussian statistics. Precisely. And that fractional Gaussian statistics has a power law, which is uh, which is not not one. I mean, it's less than one. And that immediately that same exponent ref is reflected in the in in this uh, in this decay of the yeah uh, the decay exponent. Yeah, very right. And uh, I'm also grateful because you allow me to uh, pay a tribute to Men to Benoit Mendelbrot, yeah. who did fantastic work in this area. Actually, yeah. in fact, I, what we have done, you know, but uh, if you look at uh, the fractal geometry of nature, the beautiful book that, uh, that started the whole business we looked at. Um, one of the examples he was taking um, to show that nature, you know, uh, clouds are not, uh, what is clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, nor uh, uh, lightning travels in straight lines, right? Um, what the example he was taking was Hack Law, one of the show that I showed you here, that is, if you take different catchments, if you take the mainstream length plotted against uh, the area, that's in Mendelbrot's example. Uh, it's well known that almost everywhere, this exponent is 0.57, very different from the 0.5 exponent you would have if the, uh, the diagonal of any geometrical figure. On this basis, he's questioned the thing and he started the business that led to the fractional Gaussian noise. noise. And I, 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 don't know, I don't know if you're a mathematician, et cetera. Mathematicians have been uh, treating badly and poorly Benoit Mandelbrot. Benoit Mandelbrot, was an engineer, so probably was not formal as he should have been. But I can tell you that the vision of that guy was absolutely superb. And we wouldn't have gotten into all this if he didn't do it. So I, I really I really thank you for mentioning this. Actually, the the, the modern name that, that comes to mind on this is uh, Yossi Klafter. Uh, he has done a lot of work on these fractals and uh, and the uh, fractional Gaussian statistics and and uh, turbulence in the context of this non-local interactions and this non-trivial power laws. And then you had George and the Levy processes. Sorry, Levy process. And then you had Giorgio Parisi. You have uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and you had, uh, well, and and Uriel Frisch is uh, for that matter, etc. There's a, there's yeah. very much on that. Is he, yeah. the, the thing is that uh, every ramification, every step side, every side step you do. You go into territories in which you have zillions of paper to read. Yeah. So what I was trying to present was simply like, uh, uh, like a, 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 it's my own idiosyncratic thinking, but in which there is um, at least I know what I want, <laughs> however incomplete the explanation. But anyways, very well taken points. Yes, I completely agree. I see, uh, Mark has a question. Hi, Andrea. Ciao, Mark. Good yeah. to see you, my friend. Yeah. Hi. Long time no see. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the the COVID doing, eh? So yeah. uh, otherwise, how will we soon yeah. resume our meetings? Uh, AGU, EGU. Yeah, whatever. exactly. So I was wondering, eh, these uh, power laws, if you would uh, apply them to say uh, complete ecosystem, so productivity. So you plot productivity against uh, some other measure of an ecosystem. Would you get the same scaling laws, or or do, are they only look? Uh, are they only valid for? species assemblages or individual species of different size. What is remarkable that it seemed to be uh, of broad applicability. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Jeffrey West, uh, uh, have you read those papers on the urban metabolism? Mm -hmm. If you take a measure of urban metabolism, like uh, GDP or produced or the number of uh, incoming groceries, et cetera, against the size of the city, believe, believe it or not, it goes through a, well, a, a relationship with an exponent, which is, you know, of course, people still fight about whether it's two thirds, it'll be like surface to volume ratio mm -hmm. or three quarters. But regardless of that, it is totally remarkable. Why do you have cities of all sizes, Jesus Christ? Nobody told them to. Why don't you have a small size, a medium size, and a big size, and that's it? No, you got all of them. Nobody told them. It's a completely mm -hmm. self organized process. Nobody told them. That. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. And that's precisely why this is important. Not only that. The scaling exponent is terribly predictive. So, for instance, you cut in half an ecosystem with a, a, a highway, and you have the, the thing, etc. Predictive the consequences. I mean, the biggest mammal in there would disappear because the one that can survive is a resource limitation. 
kind of a thing. Of course, asymptotically. But uh, uh, the value, if, if you probably read, everybody has read recently the Descupta review on the economic biodiversity. I mean, shrink islands or shrink domains, etc. that would be responsible for biodiversity. Then ecosystem services are important to, to no economy can thrive by mining the natural capital. Mm. So this is the only way I can see in which you can actually, within a snapshot, predict what's going to happen. And that's why I, I think, and why they emerge, and, and I keep saying that it's a, to the work of uh, the late Per Bach, whom I admire very much. Mm. Uh, per was, uh, was seeing in this the mark of self-organized criticality. That is why the system is poised at criticality, regardless of, uh, uh, in the case of rivers, um, and he was kind enough to quote the example of the rivers in a fair detail in his uh, modestly titled book, How Nature Works. <laughs> you remember that. But um, why you have this power law of aggregated area, regardless of geology, regardless of climate, regardless of uh, 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 exposed lithology, the type of vegetation you have, it does it nonetheless. It's like in the system that uh, in, a, in, a, in statistical mechanics, you call them quenched randomness. That is, say you prevent, you get a certain niche structure to a network, an evolving network, and you clump a few places, you say, you guys don't move, whatever mm -hmm. happens. These are called quenched randomness. What the system does, it kind of, uh, uh, of, of copes and produce the same statistics, the same shape. There's something inevitable in there. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 my bet is that whatever you do, uh, Mark, you will get um, something that looks like a power law. Yeah. yeah. Because there's, there's no preferential size, you see, whatever you measure. There's no preferential quantity. It, it's, it's a very, oh, okay. nature okay. is very, is very uh, well, the, the iron preferred uh, assemblages. They're not preferred size of a city. They're not preferred. Uh, <laughs> it's very, it's very, uh, it, it's it's ironing out inequalities in a sense. Yeah. What matters, for instance, I mean, uh, in any ecosystem, you have more ants than elephants, right? Why? Because it, it's a matter of resource limitation, and the system adjusts and the whole thing co-evolves. Mm. But but not to the point that, for instance, a power law has very precise connotation, very precise thing. It's scale invariant. You coarse grain and you still have the same power law. And if, if you can establish that, there's a hell of a lot of tools that uh, you, can, you can use, actually. Okay. Any other question to Andrea? I don't see any one more. Oh. Yeah, you still have some question? Yeah, that's uh, my experience is that power and the weakness of power laws is that it simplifies the relationships. So it makes it possible to see relationship in that particular way, which you otherwise might not see. But at the same time, it sort of removes all the subtleties that is, is, are in the relationship. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? No, 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 I, I, well, I agree. But at the same time, um, if you have like uh, an evolutionary processes in which you measure, for instance, the relative proportion of sizes of something, okay, of uh, boulders that you, if you have fragmentation in, in geophysics, you remember the classic works that uh, had been done on that, you, you, you had a blast and you start counting, picking up the pieces, right? You have to tell me why on earth you get pieces of all sizes. <laughs> And why, whatever blast you place on that, granite or whatever you have it, et cetera, the slope of the damn curve in which you put the relative proportions against the size is the same. Okay. So in essence, they wipe out certain things, but they are telling you something. There's something in which there's nothing preferred in the system. There's something fair, an egalitarian one. If, if you get, the, what was the absolutely breath? I mean, Penny Chisholm is one of the best uh, marine biologists on earth. And she's a very dear friend. And she introduced me. I took her, I mean, I sat when I was in sabbatical at MIT. I sat in her first grade, first year ecology class. We was to me, I mean, opening my mind. I had a fantastic experience of that. She was telling me, look, you have to explain. I was uh, on, the, on the road to Damascus because what I'm saying is that I go in the field. Uh, they, they were the portable flow cytometers then, right? Those flow cytometers, they do uh, forward light scattering. And uh, in this, essentially, you have a capillary through which this thing here, but you cover like four or five orders of magnitude. 
and and you can even stain to know if there's detritus that is inorganic matter or is something organic matter coming on into the cyst. So you get you you I mean you really get nicely uh, bacteria, however undefined, uh, species wise or functional group wise. You get um, you get uh, uh, phytoplankton, you get zooplankton with uh, intertwined sizes, etc. You don't distinguish that. You simply get a relative amount and a relative count of the size of a living organism. How many you have a certain thing? And she said, she was flabbergasted. Why do you have organisms of all sizes? And that's a biologist asking you the question. Mm. Okay, thanks. It, it, wipes out, it wipes out certain complexities, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, if you want to make a synthesis of some of, of uh, that's that's a hell of an important question, in my view. It's a hell of an unresolved question and it's a hell of implications. Again, one for all, uh, there is a clear evidence from fossil record to whatever that um, uh, the, uh, the maximum size of the organism colonizing ecosystem is related to the size of the ecosystem. Okay, now, cut a, a rainforest with a highway and isolating the parts we do that, it's predictable and it has been observed that you have the extinction uh, in, the, in, in, in ecological timescales, not in evolutionary timescales, of, uh, of a larger size organism. That's entirely predicted by the, by the power law. Okay. Is Thanks. that also related to the species area, the species abundance area relationship? Yeah. Is that the same mechanism? Yeah, they, they, are, they are related. Well, yeah. what is very, that, that I am sure, because we have shown it uh, in, in a couple of cases. It, a good example is the example of a, of a, of a, uh, a cruise that Penny took along the Caribbean from the oligotrophic to the uh, hypertrophic things, et cetera. What you would get in there, you had, uh, and then when they did, she also did iron fertilization, you had those blooms relaxing then the, the iron X experiment. What was clear is that once you approach the oligotrophic thing, the, 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 the small bugs do better than the big bugs in terms of, uh, of uh, abundance. Mm. So the slope becomes steeper. Now, believe it or not, that is a very precise adjustment of the abundance of each species. Nobody told them to do that. Mm. So there are uh, power laws cannot be treated in isolation, that I'm sure, that we have seen very clearly. Okay, thank you. Okay, any final question? If not, then uh, I thank Andrea again, fantastic uh, for the fantastic lecture and also the nice discussion afterwards. It's a fascinating, nice fascinating it's subject. Pleasure. Even to see uh, friends that I haven't seen for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> including <laughs> yourself. <laughs> and uh, say hello to me, to Sebastiano. Who okay, okay. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> you see him. He drops, yeah. by, I, I don't, he drops by for coffee tomorrow because okay, we, okay. we tell him. Good. So, okay. uh, and thank you all for attending uh, today. And um, maybe uh, for the remainder tomorrow is our COVID-19 uh, symposium at two o'clock. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll be interesting symposium, I think. Uh, so if you have time, uh, please attend uh, to that. Then thank you all for being here and uh, wish you a nice rest of the day. Bye-bye. Oh, thank bye. you. Bye. bye.